All right, let's get started. So this is Wireless for Control Technology Forum. We've got a esteemed panel of experts up front. The agenda is there's three talks. This is a forum, so that we, we want to encourage questions, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But the first talk is Wireless Heart Benefits, Single-Use Disposable Bioreactor. The second one is Control Using Wireless Transmitters. And the third one is a talk on the pilot plant a pilot plant wireless instrumentation at JJ Pickle. Here's our, our, our panel of experts. Mitch is uh, Panther is the uh, responsible for wireless heart capabilities of the Fisher TopWorks 4300 series. He's also a contributor to the heart working group for the heart specification enhancements in the area of digital control over heart and wireless heart. So he's a developer that works on making we're going to make improvements to wireless heart for the end control, for an output, okay? We're having to make some changes. Eric Rotvold is a distinguished technologist at Emerson Process Management, has been working in process automation for over 25 years. He has been involved in the development of many heart, Profibus, foundation field bus measurement instruments during his career. Recently, he has been engaged in the development of the IEC 62591, which rolls off the tongue, wireless heart standard and products that implement the standard. He's the system architect for Emerson Smart Wireless Solutions and continues to advance wireless technology and process automation. Bailey Roach is currently pursuing a PhD in the Process Science and Technology Center at the University of Texas at Austin. A Virginia Tech graduate, she held an entry-level engineering position with ExxonMobil prior to entering graduate school. Her PhD studies involve building a pilot-scale dividing wall distillation column which will be used to develop basic simulation design and control methodologies. The research program <coughs> combines the industrial experience and academic research expertise to develop a novel separations technology which will address current and future process requirements. And last but not least, he really does not require an introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway, is Terry Blevins. Uh, he is the team lead for the development of Delta V Advanced Control products and of the Foundation Field Bus Function Block Specification. He is a technical advisor to the United States Technical Advisory Group for the IEC 65E. He co-authored the ISA best-selling books, Advanced Control Unleashed and Control Loop Foundation, and is a member of Control Magazine's Process Automation Hall of Fame and an ISA Fellow. He is Principal Technologist at Emerson Process Management. All right, I am your moderator, uh, Neil Peterson. Uh, I'm gonna do, uh, you know, uh, Set the tone, tell a few jokes, crowd control, obviously we need that, uh, and uh, keep things moving along. First, for all of you who have attended, we have 50 copies of the new book, Wireless Control Foundation, which is part of the basis for this uh, technology forum, here up front for those of you who are interested. Uh, I got to read a draft of this book, and let me tell you that it has probably the answers to all the questions I have ever been asked about wireless field networks, which leaves only one question. Terry, what took you so long to <laughs> write this book? And also, I think I'm out of a job. So uh, I don't have to answer any more questions. All right, so technology forum. Discuss emerging technological trends, current use cases, practical uses, and benefits with industry experts and peers. That's all of us. We wanted to stimulate the conversation with some talks. And there was a number of different ways we thought about that we could do this. Um, and what we decided to do is we're going to have kind of a, I don't know, like a free for all. It might be a bit mm -hmm. much. But what we want to do is encourage you to ask questions. We're going to give the three presentations. We want you to ask questions while we're getting them. Okay. And so if we go off in the weeds, that's okay. I'll bring us back in. And we'll continue the presentation. If someone, you know, if we get a little off track, we'll we'll try to, to rail it in. But the idea is that we're stimulating conversation. We want to hear from you. If you have an opinion, we want you to express. If you got a question, we want you to, to give it. So this is a, an exchange of information between everyone. All right. And and uh, lastly, uh, unfortunately, we had uh, Scott Broadley, who was going to present first, but he had a, a family emergency, and so he was not able to make it to exchange. And so Terry is going to present uh, his, his topic. He's very familiar with it. Uh, we didn't have time to, to switch out topics. It was a you know, last minute emergency. And so he'll present it. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can on that topic. All right. And with that, I'll turn it over to Terry. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's great to see this uh, attendance here, to see the interest in uh, wireless control. Uh, I really uh, uh, regret the fact that Scott couldn't be here. His father fell, and he, he has some uh, medical things that he had to do with his father. But, uh, you know, broadly, James has had a really an important role in terms of wireless control. Uh, they're the first manufacturer who implemented wireless control with PID and Rosemont wireless heart devices on a process uh, of commercial scale. So uh, this work was actually done back in 2009 when the first uh, devices were becoming available. So they sort of cut the ground in terms of uh, proving and showing what could be done in that area. Those of you who aren't maybe familiar with Broadly James, uh, they're a uh, leading manufacturer of bioreactors that are used in the pharmaceutical industry. They sell with the bioreactor a control system called BioNet that is based upon Delta V. They also apply this BioNet technology to a, a disposable bioreactor that's of commercial skill. So when we suggested to Scott uh, broadly that there was this opportunity to field trial wireless control to get a feel for its potential in his industry, uh, he uh, offered uh, control of one of these disposable bioreactors as the target platform that we'll be putting this on. Uh, and for control purposes, uh, he was looking at two critical loops within the uh, bioreactor, the temperature and the pH. You know, you have a million cells growing in this bioreactor, and if the pH or temperature are off by very much, you really impact what is happening. So I uh, picked some uh, good applications there. The purpose of the field trial that we did with them was not only to prove uh, the viability of the control and to show that that could be done well on such a sensitive application as this, but also to explore uh, the different communication capabilities you have with wireless heart. Uh, you have something called windowed communications, and you can also have periodic update. And so we wanted to try both. Uh, the pH transmitter that Rosemont makes supports both, and so we used it for the windowed communication, and we used periodic for the temperature and also for the pressure. Uh, this is a, a picture of the actual installation at uh, Broadly James. So they, uh, they instrumented it then with uh, the Rosemont devices. Uh, the bio uh, net uh, interface is uh, customized to meet the requirements of pharmaceutical industry. So, but behind the scene is uh, Delta V. Now you think back to 2009, you didn't have PID plus in the Delta V PID as an option. But the thing is you can actually create a link composite that you can just add right into your module and essentially converts then your PID to PID plus. And so that's what we did in this case. Uh, in terms of performance and behavior, it's identical to what you would have if you had a, a, a version 11 or version 12 with native PID plus uh, in it. So we, we used that sort of a close up of the pH transmitter. Uh, this shows uh, one of the runs. So they actually did uh, batch runs using the million cells and the medium that you normally would use in the bioreactor. So it's very much like an industrial application. And ran the batches. Uh, we, uh, you can see the temperature control here. If you look at the, uh, the scale over in the left-hand side, you see that it's extremely precise temperature control that was provided. And this was then using uh, the wireless uh, temperature transmitter and PID+. Plus. For pH, uh, again, you look at the uh, scale over on the left-hand side, extremely precise pH control is required in this kind of an application. And uh, using the pH wireless transmitter, PID+, Plus, they were able to duplicate what they would have done if they'd had a wired installation. So, you know, this is a, a good, two good examples then of where this was applied with really great success in terms of the control of the process. 
some things happened during these batch runs that uh, were unexpected. And uh, this is one. Uh, you notice we had the wired pH transmitter as well as the wireless. And you notice the wired the little spike right in there. It's when they started a motor and you know it's a thing that can happen in any industrial installation if you don't quite have the grounding and shielding correct. So, uh, you know, it sort of indicates that there are some added value in terms of wireless, in terms of uh, rejection of noise and things that you might have in a wired installation. So this is uh, the benefits that uh, Scott talked about after the, after the uh, field trial. We did a, a presentation of this in 2009, so if you want to see the full presentation that he gave at that time, then you can go back to the archives of 2009 and, and look at that. So anyway, that's pretty much what I had to present on, on this. Um, so it's not your typical application and chemical and that, but uh, it uh, really does show the value. Broadly James is a very innovative company, so they wanted to try this to understand the technology, and, and we really appreciate them working with us. A real uh, mark in terms of the history on wireless control, uh, they were the first in terms of doing that. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, control with wireless uh, transmitters. And uh, you know, I think a lot of people have installed wireless for monitoring, they have maybe installed wireless for interfacing to on off valves. And what people are finding is it's very much durable, that is they can depend on it. And so you see a lot of interest now in terms of doing control with wireless. Uh, here last year we went over to Namur. Uh, they had a users group where they had been uh, looking at wireless for a couple of years. Uh, they were finding great success with it for monitoring. Their question was, how do you do control with it? So uh, I think we have a really good response with the PID+. Plus. Anyway, before we get into talking about it, I think in terms of understanding the benefits of PID Plus, it's good to sort of step back and look at some of the underlying principles and foundation for wired control today. If you look at uh, anyone's DCS, uh, pretty much they are designed the same way. That is, if you have a process where if you were to change, say, your valve position and look at your control parameter, then there's a certain time frame in which the process responds. And uh, so that's the process response time, then is the dead time plus the time constant, you know. And in your like liquid flow loops and that, this may be a second or two. Uh, other loops, it may depend upon the process where it's a temperature flow. But uh, if you look at how the system is designed, the recommendation is, is that you need to be executing control at least four times over your process response time. So what does this mean? That means if you have a one second response time, say on a liquid flow, well, how fast should you be executing your control? Ever 250 milliseconds. So you can look at your dynamics of your applications and say, how fast should I execute control to get best performance? Now then, in control, you know, our enemy is dead time. And so to eliminate any dead time due to sampling, what often happens in most DCSs is that the I.O. is sampled very quickly. So like in Delta V, your I.O. is updated about every 50 milliseconds in terms of your memory. And if you're using, say, a Rosemont transmitter, well, it's updating every 20, sec 20 times a second. Uh, when you actually execute control, the delay that may be between the measurement being sensed and you using it in control is very small. Now then, if you look at that design then, and you then reflect on what you can do with wireless, if you want a five to seven year battery life, then what you're really talking about is an eight or maybe a 16 second update. That's just the fact of life. And, you know, I, I read some papers and, you know, people be talking about updating once a second. And I say, where did they come from, right? Uh, that, where did they get their battery? Because, uh, you know, battery technology is such that you're really talking about eight or 16 second update. So 
that's the reality of it. Now then, if you say, well, I have an eight second update and when we use our rule of four, that is we have to have a new measurement each time we execute, then you're talking about processes that response, the response time is 32 seconds or longer to do effective control if you were trying to use a regular PID. And probably a good 50% of your applications are faster than that, right? So what do you do to address those? Well, let's look at what happens if you violate that rule of four. Okay, so if we take a process and uh, the response time is uh, eight seconds, so we have two seconds of dead time, six second time constant, then, uh, and we tune our control for lambda tuning, and we go in and we change our set point. This is the kind of response, if we're sampling four times as fast as our process response time. Now, this is using a wireless measurement. Now, you look at that and you say, well, it doesn't really look all that bad. I see the actual updates, so I see the little stair steps where it's updating, right? But overall, the control is, is pretty good. But this is where we're updating or controlling four times over my process response time. What happens if we are uh, updating at the process response time? If you uh, look at that, then you notice the response isn't so great. So you say, well, Terry, you know, I, I could just uh, change that reset. As soon as you do that, to get rid of some of that, you've really detuned the control. Your performance in terms of response to unmeasured disturbances just as really suffer if you do something like that. So if you were to go further and say that uh, the, uh, you're two times uh, slower than the process response time, so let's say you were uh, at eight seconds, so you're... Um, two times uh, slower than that response time, so uh, 16 second update, then this is what you get. You're almost unstable. So that's using PID, traditional PID. So you say, well, you know, that's not so good. I sure wouldn't want that in my plant, right? So how do you then address it? Well, you really have to rethink things. And that's what happened when the wireless heart spec was put together. There was a lot of discussion back in 2004 about control when the actual specification was written. And in 2005, coming out of that was the PID Plus. So that, that technology has developed at that point in time. And up until this time, really control systems have mimicked analog control. That is, we've scanned fast enough, we've updated fast enough, they get the performance of an analog controller. With wireless, then we really need to think about how we structure our control different to accommodate these slower update rates. So it's good to think about how does the reset of your controller actually work? Now, if you open an academic book, you know, then probably they're showing the reset contribution just as an integrator. So you're taking proportional times error, integrating that, summing in proportional times error, so you get your proportional reset contribution. Okay, so that's how it would be shown in academics. But you get into all sorts of trouble, like if you hit a limit here, you have to have logic to somehow turn off the integrator and all sorts of things like that. So most major manufacturers do not do it that way. The way reset is created is using a positive feedback network. And you apply a first order filter here. The time constant of that is your reset time. Now, mathematically, that's identical to this, except when you hit a limit. And so you really, in this way of doing things, you don't have to worry about reset windup because this filter will never exceed your output limits. The reset is automatically clamped in terms of what happens. Okay, so understanding that, if you look at the tuning rules that are normally applied, uh, lambda tuning, uh, look at IMC tuning, the different rules that are out there and there are books on it, you find that the reset time 
is always turns out to be the time constant in your process plus maybe the dead time or very close to that. So you say, well, that's funny. Why, why does it turn out that all these tuning rules tell me to set it that way? Well, it's mainly because this filter is really reflecting the process dynamics of your process. So we set this filter dynamically to sort of match what's going on over here. Now this is best demonstrated if we were to tune a control loop for lambda tuning with a lambda factor of one, meaning your closed loop and open loop time constant are equal. For that particular case, if we change the uh, set point, then what you see is something really very interesting. You see the output changes only one time. Now in response to that, my process is actually changing after the dead time. But you notice I don't do anything here with a regular PID. And the reason for that is that filter is exactly dynamically matching my process response, right? <coughs> and that's why it works that way. And that's why our tuning turns out to be what it is ter in terms of setting the reset. So you say, well, what if I don't have a new measurement update? What do I do? Well, it turns out that if this is reflecting what happens in your process, then when you change your output, the process is going to continue to respond irregardless of where you're communicating it, right? So the rationalization is that filter should continue. And therefore, it's reflecting what's happening here. But we break the positive feedback network and only apply the output when we have a new measurement. Okay, so that's, that's the change that occurs. On the derivative part, if you're normally on a derivative ever execution, you're looking at the change in value. But if you're using wireless, you could be having a constant value for eight seconds, and then suddenly a big step change, and a derivative of step change is a big spike. So that, that's not any good. So you then have to take the derivative over the time frame between measurement updates. And then you don't have these spikes on update. So that, that's the change. Now, if you then apply PID plus, in this case, uh, we had a, uh, uh, windowed communication, uh, communication refresh at 10 seconds, once one percent. So it had to change at least one percent. And on a set point change, you notice comparing PID plus with wireless to PID with wired, you notice that on a set point change, the response, the valve change is very close to each other. On a unmeasured low disturbance, where we get a deviation from set point, you notice both respond very closely. The interesting thing is, is that when you get an update, you notice it exactly matches where you would have been if you'd had a wired measurement. So it's quite effective in terms of being able to handle these slower update rates and still give you good control. The interesting thing is with PID Plus, the tuning is independent of how often you're updating. You only set the tuning based upon the process gain and dead time and time constant. Set the tuning, don't worry about how often you're updating, and uh, it does great. Now, we had the question about what happens if I have a, a <coughs> failure, that is, I lose communication, and that doesn't happen very often. You know, with uh, wireless heart, you get really great reports in terms of reliability. But if, for instance, you know, management asks, well, what happens if I lose it? Well, if you were to use a PID, Let's say you had a slow process and you said, well, I can observe the rule of four to one. I'll just use PID with my wireless measurement. What would happen if you happen to lose the measurement? With PID, you get something like that. The reset doesn't have the knowledge to know that. It just keeps right on grinding on, right? But if you have PID plus and you lose the measurement, it's not going to be doing anything until it gets another new measurement, right? And so the behavior is, is very nice under that condition.
That would be for a communication loss, both for the case of PID and PID plus. So we have an apples apples comparison here. If you had a unmeasured disturbance and midway through it, you lost communication. Again, really poor performance for the PID, but with PID plus you do pretty well. Okay, any, any questions on the PID plus and how it works? Okay, hopefully that, that clarifies in your mind. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's, let's touch on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Here, this is sort of important in terms of like if you look at the integral of absolute error and you compare it, you find that with wireless, you're not quite as good as if you were wired, right? But the important thing here is, is that with wired, you use 692 new measurements. With wireless, it only required 25 over that entire time to do equivalent control. So, you know, if you look at then power requirements and other things, huge difference here. And uh, with PID Plus, you can, you can handle the slower update and do a great job on control. Okay, in terms of uh, implementation, in Delta V, uh, you just go to the FRSI PID option, check PID plus, and you're off and going. That, that's it. Uh, but there are, are a couple of things in addition to that that you need to pay attention to. Uh, one is, is that you don't want to use filtering in your control path. If you need filtering, adjust the dampening at your transmitter. And the reason for that is, is that the PID plus senses it has a new measurement by seeing the value change in like the sixth decimal place. Now then, if you were to put filtering in here, you might get a, a new measurement, but then every time you execute it on control, you'd think you had a new measurement because the filtered value continues to change, right? So it would really destroy what PID is trying to do. So it can't use filtering. The heart uh, specification says that the timestamp is always communicated with the value, but at least in the current implementation of Delta V, we don't use the timestamp to detect new value. We actually look at change in value to do that. Ramification is don't use filtering in the block. And actually from a standpoint of aliasing and other things, that's where you need to apply it anyway, at the, at the source, right? because you're sampling at a slower rate and to prevent aliasing, you need to get it out at the source there. The other thing that's really very important is, is that your module execution needs to be set much faster than your update rate. So we just sort of flip the whole card around. You know, in traditional implementation, you have the sampling every 50 milliseconds coming in and have a module maybe executing once a second. Here we flipped it where the measurements may be updating every eight seconds such that we want to minimize the delay introduced. We want as soon as the module executes and there's a new value for it to be used. And so we don't want to have a delay in using the new, ma new value that came in. So we just sort of flip the whole thing 180 degrees here. So the PID should be executed on a fairly fast basis. And like here, we're talking about maybe over 200 milliseconds. So the maximum delay between the new wireless measurement coming in and being used and control would be 200 milliseconds. Okay, uh, recently, uh, Mitch and I uh, did some pretty interesting tests up in the Flow Lab in Marshalltown uh, here a couple of months ago. And uh, fairly hefty pumps, uh, large industrial size valves and lines. So it wasn't a tinker toy. It's a fairly, um, fairly uh, realistic kind of environment. We were testing wireless uh, control using a wireless transmitter and also something that you can't purchase quite today as a wireless throttling valve. So we we're testing that. So a lot of the focus was on that wireless uh, throttling valve. But we also, as a side benefit, were able to test the wireless uh, transmitter as well. We spent about a week uh, fairly intensive testing of just this simple liquid flow loop using various combinations of wired and wireless. So you can see up here, 
wired, wireless, wired, wireless. Um, there's something we're really not talking about so much today, or something called minimization of valve movement. You'll probably be hearing more about that. That works even in a wired environment. So we're sort of testing that. And uh, looking at both set point change and disturbances. And this is sort of the summary. But really what we proved there was that the tuning is only based on your process dynamics when you use um, PID+. Plus. It doesn't really impact the performance if you change your update rate. We tested that uh, throughout the, the tests that we did. Uh, for most of the tests, our update rate was 8 seconds. That's on a liquid flow loop where the process response is about 3 seconds. So we violated this 4 to 1 rule all over the place, right? We tune the PID for wired input, wired output using the PID on-demand tuner because we didn't want anyone to say, well, you had some expert tuning, right? We just used whatever it gave. That's what we used. And we used that tuning for wired as well as wire wireless. We never changed the tuning throughout the test. Anyway, so this was with the wired input, wired output. And you notice there are some gyrations going on in here. Uh, the tank and other things were really introducing some interesting dynamics in terms of this flow loop here. It wasn't uh, as straightforward as it might look in that picture. But this was for wired input, wired output, the kind of performance you, you saw there. Uh, we could introduce an unmeasured disturbance. We had a, a load valve downstream of our control valve. So we could be changing that to cause an unmeasured disturbance in our process uh, control of the flow. This is the valve position of our load valve, its impact upon the actual flow, and then the change in valve position required to correct for that. Until you get a new measurement update, you can't respond to an unmeasured disturbance. And therefore, you know, we don't really recommend you use it on a really like a liquid flow, liquid pressure where you need to respond within a second or half a second, right? Because if you're updating every eight seconds, you just can't catch it, right? But so many of our applications out there today, it's not that case where you have to respond within a half a second to something. And so for the vast majority, it's pretty appropriate in terms of what we're doing. And the delay is something we always try to minimize. Like that's why we execute the module at maybe 200 milliseconds to prevent introducing delay into the control loop. So we have to keep those two things separate, sample rate versus delay that's introduced, right? And uh, so we, we took some special precautions, especially in terms of talking to the valve to account for delay in communicating to the valve and variability. And, and this presentation that's coming up on throttling valves, we get more into that in much more detail what we did to accommodate that. Okay, so uh, this is uh, with eight second update. And if you were to compare the uh, response uh, to the wired, uh, there's really not a lot of difference between the two. When you go to 16 second update, Again, we didn't touch the tuning, so no, nothing happened on the tuning. You do see that we only can respond when we actually get a measurement update, and with it being every 16 seconds, we can immediately respond. But if you look at it, it's stable over the entire region. It does respond. You do come to set point, and so uh, it uh, can be very useful, and most applications wouldn't be a problem. Okay, so that's pretty much what I had to present on that. Any questions? There are a lot of good questions here. Yes, Bob? So this uh, algorithm is available in Delta V, is that correct today? Is that today? Uh, it is in Delta V today. Uh, we started putting it in version 11. There's an improved version in version 12. Uh, the only difference between the two is 12 handles set point change beautifully. In 11, it sort of hit or miss in terms of it, and we'd have to get into how we did the filter on that. But uh, basically, in 12, it's, it's everything that you saw here. Uh, if you have an older Delta V system, 
uh, that composite that turns your PID into PID plus. Uh, I'd be glad to send you that. Just let me know. Actually, I'll probably put it out on um, on uh, the web here where everyone can access it. And if you have a non-Delta V system, but you're using wireless heart devices, then there's going to be an announcement here uh, this week that uh, you can use this on any system if you're using wireless heart transmitters and valves. Okay, and so we have like three patents on this technology, but uh, we're giving the patent rights to the wireless heart found uh, to the heart foundation um, for use of wireless heart technology. So, so we have a, a chapter in the book that we've written here on implementing a wireless control with legacy control systems. So this actually goes through how to actually create this in a legacy control system. Uh, pretty much any control system that supports external reset, uh, you can implement PID plus on it. Uh, you could use it for wired and it behave exactly like the regular PID. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, you can use it with sampled analyzers. Uh, so people who have got like lab entry are using it to enter in their data as the PV of it. When they get a change, it makes the change. Otherwise, it's not making changes. And so you can use it with sampled analysis as well. That filter, its value is not being used in the positive feedback network until you get a new measurement and then it's only applied at that time. Yeah, you know, uh, there's this technique that we're in a lot of control systems out there to handle sampled analyzers where you sort of froze the reset until you got a new measurement, turned it on for a period of time and this kind of thing. Uh, those kinds of implementations are really fraught with problems. You then have to worry about how often you're sampling and that kind of thing. But here you just tune it like you would normally based on the process dynamics. Don't worry about how often it's updating and it behaves quite well. I'll turn it over to Bailey. She's going to talk about future things here that uh, are going on. Um, so I'm Bailey Roach. I am a PhD student at University of Texas. Um, I am presenting on behalf of Frank Seibert. He is our plant manager. Um, so if I'm not able to answer a question, um, I see Robert, one of our full-time operators at our plant is here, so he can field it as well as Terry. So to give you a little background at Pickle, um, the Separations Research Unit, uh, we were funded in 1984. It's a um, conglomeration between research. Um, we saw a need for um, a tie between university research and industrial needs. So Jim Fair founded the pilot plant, and currently we employ several grad students and undergrads in research. And so the university provides the framework for the equipment, and then we have companies that will fund certain projects. To give you a little history of our wireless, um, our first gateway was installed in 2009, um, and we used that. I'll talk about it on the next slide, but we used it on our 18-inch distillation column. Um, and since then, the trend has continued to go up. Um, in 2014, the divided wall column came online. And so in total, right now we have 46 instruments. Um, and Frank wanted me to emphasize throughout the presentation, we just want this to keep going up. We love wireless at our research facility, and he hopes that this continues to grow. So to start with, the first item we installed was for our 18-inch distillation column. Um, we use the 3051 for the steam floater, the reboiler, the column pressure, and the steam pressure. Um, Frank wanted me to point out also, we're not afraid to put this on major assets. So we're monitoring pressure wirelessly. Um, we also have an older boiler, and so we have wireless transmitters on that as well. And then the vibration sensor. And so what we did was they were both wired and wireless, so we tested initially with wired control, and then we transitioned to wireless. And what we found is we had successful control with both, um, and we continue to use the wireless devices. Um, there's not a lot of facts proven with this, but we seem to feel like the wireless is just more reliable. Um, we had a couple of tests to go. One of the wired transmitters went out, um, and we seamlessly switched to wireless. So it's fantastic, especially 
Um, with an older steam boiler, it's um, over 30 years old, and with it going out, um, we're kind of without any steam. So it's um, we definitely need to monitor that. Um, another thing I wanted to point on with safety showers, um, it is a research institution, so we have several undergraduates and graduates going around the plant. Um, so we have two wireless safety showers um, installed. They're quick response. Um, we gave a tour and one of the tour people leaned against the shower and it went off. But we found that out very quickly. Um, they were easy to install. They're retrofitable to our previous showers. Um, so we're very proud of those. And you can see one actually on the right. Another thing that we use wireless is the level monitoring. Um, we have as a safety precaution for overfilling vessels, the 2160 helps us. Um, additionally, the 3308 helps solve um, an issue we're having with a liquid-liquid extraction. Um, our rag level was interfering with our measurement, and the operators would mistakenly add water to it um, and then would create an emulsion and the feed tank. So we would have to shut down let those um, separate and it would cause our process disruption. So we installed this and we're able to monitor the level um, much closer. So here's my baby. Um, it's the divided wall distillation. Um, we installed it um, in August. So it's very new and exciting for us. So to give you a background, what a divided wall is, um, it can do a ternary separation in one column. So traditional distillation, you have two components go in, and out the top you'll get the lighter component, and out the bottom the heavier component. But with the divided wall, you can actually do this in one column with the wall in the middle and pull out a side stream. So with the traditional unit, you would need two columns in order to have the same separation. And so for our pilot column, it's six inches and approximately 28 stages. So you may ask, um, why would a divided wall distillation? Well, you can save anywhere from 30 to 50% energy savings, as well as, I mean, it's you only have one column over two columns, so you save plant space, um, and then you have an environmental impact, and, um, but there hasn't been a lot of research um, in the open literature on divided wall columns. So our pilot was able to fund this research. So wirelessly, um, we have several items. Um, six throttling valves, which I'll talk about on the next slide, um, flow transmitters, level transmitters, pressure transmitters, um, and these are one of the most important things we'll be monitoring. Um, we have a pressure transmitter across just the wall of the column, and then as well as for the overall column. For a divided wall, you want to keep the pressure, the DP, as low as possible. Um, and then we have eight TMXs. Um, so in total, we have 32 transmitter um, available. I think as of last week, we had 30, so we only have two open spots. Um, if we were to have to wire all of these, we still would be running conduit. Um, and then we'll have one wireless steam trap. So to give you a general flow diagram of our process, we have the feed going in um, through a feed heater. And so you have the light key coming out the top, and then this is a continuous process, so the products will actually go back to the feed tank. So you have the A product that's recirculating back to the feed tank, and then the condenser is sending liquid back. And then the same with the bottom, you'll have the reboiler with the heavy product going back to the feed tank and then back. But one thing to note, um, with wireless control over traditional distillation, you have additional degrees of freedom. So one of those is the liquid split at the top of the wall. So from control papers, this is the most critical area for a divided wall. Um, so for us, with a six inch column, it's very difficult inside the column to control that split because you don't want 50-50 down the column. You actually want to physically control how much goes to each side. So what we're doing is we have a total trap tray inside the column. We're going to pull all of the liquid out, run, put in a vessel, through a pump, have a heat exchanger so we can heat it up to the same temperature of what we're pulling out the column, and then control that split with two control valves. 
Um, and then for the side stream product, um, it's the same idea. Um, we're going to have a total trap tray here, pull it into a vessel, and then the same way. And then instead of it going back to the column, one will go back to the feed tank. Um, so the item circle it in red will actually be wireless um, able control. So two of those are steam, and then four of those would be actual, for our first test, it'll be hydrocarbon. So they'll be controlling the hydrocarbon back to the column. So we will have the ability to switch between wired and wireless. Um, unfortunately, as in research, we do not have data yet for the control analysis. Uh, we've had a bit of delays, but here's my shameless plug for next year. Look for data then, hopefully. As well as if you want to know more about um, the MPC control, um, we have another session. But the wireless will be used in very critical loops for the divided wall column. Um, some of the additional devices that we have, um, the steam trap monitor, um, we're still in the process of te uh, testing the capabilities, um, but Robert, when he installed this, said it was one of the easiest installations he's done. Um, it took him less than 30 minutes, and um, we'll test that, and we can show you the results next year. Um, the majority of our pilot plant temperatures are now um, wireless. It's an older unit, um, about 30 years old for our pilot plant. We're restricted with space. Um, we're continually changing what we'll be testing. So we're limited on how much conduit we can run. And so this has been a major saver to us. So some of the benefits we've had, um, like I've said, for installation, the upfront cost is slightly more, but in the long run, I mean, it saved us so much money. And so like Frank said, we love wireless. Very cost effective for us, um, much quicker rapid installation. Um, we're a lean unit. We have three full-time or four full-time people staff at the SRP, um, and so we just, with wireless, it's able to go much quicker and we won't have as many delays. Um, we find it very reliable for us. Some of the learnings that we've had from wireless, um, the issues that have occurred were regardless of wired or wireless. So we haven't experienced any major hurdles. Um, one thing to note for some of the naming conventions, conventions um, even if you name it, it'll still appear as AO1, AO2. So you just need to be cognizant of which um, input or output you have hooked up. And then tests will be conducted to compare the control with the different upgrade, um, update rates. Um, and then we'll be using the Delta V predict to use the compens composition control based on our wireless temperature measurements. So for our column, our actual column, we have 19 temperature transmitters on it, and so we'll be using this to see which ones we'll actually use to control off of. I have one question I just realized. Hey, can you tell us a little bit what's the difference between a wireless and a wired valve? Like, what are we working on with this wireless valve? We did not talk about that at all, and I think we need to explain that. Okay, yeah. Um, so as Bailey and Terry hinted at in the presentations, um, the reason we did uh, some testing at uh, Marshalltown earlier and what will be going on at uh, UT is um, we're trying to get stuff in the Heart Foundation to do wireless control with a, uh, you know, a throttling valve. Um, so we're, we're, we did, the purpose of the test was to test out some theories of, you know, how are we going to do this wirelessly and get that in the spec. But first off, we got to make sure what we propose in the spec will work. Um, the big part of, well, half of it was um, stuff in there that isn't there today, like uh, kind of a mode for the wireless valves. You know, a 4 to 20 valve has 4 to 20 signal. We don't have that. So we have to come up with some ways of getting around some safety aspects of that. Uh, the other half of it is kind of interesting is that, you know, this is wireless, so the amount of time it takes a command to get from the host to a device, there's some variable latency there. And if you're on Terry's end, the host, he doesn't quite know where, uh, you know, when that command gets to the device and when it gets activated. Um, there's two philosophies that, you know, you can set up publishing to tell you when that is. But we were testing out a philosophy that 
you know, the, the host itself will tell it when to act on this, uh, you know, this valve set point. So then his uh, PID uh, portion with the integral can assume and know that the valve is going to take action at this particular time because both on a wireless network devices all have a good sense of time. And so what we were doing there is just proving this out. And in some of the charts, you could see we have the wireless valve there to prove that when we know when the set point gets applied, the host system and the control still works quite well. Um, Terry was, I would say, very pleased with it. And uh, I was too, because it seemed to work pretty well. And um, we're about 90% there. We're going to be doing more testing with that in the future when we get everything in place to do basically what would be in the future. A little uh, little note, we, it's not a wireless DVC. What we did was we actually retrofitted a 4300 device to output a 4 to 20 signal, and that's what's going to be used in the field today. So the communication is going through um, wireless, but we're using a standard DVC so that in the testing at UT and, and in the lab, we could really quickly switch between one and the other. Um, we take the factor of the actual device, the DVC, moving the valve out of the equation and just focus solely on the communication path differences. When the command gets sent to the device today, it could take some amount of time to get there. You don't know exactly when, and because of the way you know wireless is, you might have retries in there of getting that path down there. So there has to be some way of the host system and the valve controller to know either when to apply this new set point or to tell the host system when it got its command and it did take action. Now the route we went with was to have the host system tell it when to apply this valve uh, set point. Uh, one of the big benefits I believe in that is that there's no user configuration in that setup. You don't have to have the user set up the device to publish correctly you know, a valve position set point and uh, get it to publish in the correct uh, report by exception or get those rates. It's all inherent in the command so the user doesn't do anything. So that's what we were trying to do as far as putting a timestamp on the command so that the valve controller gets this command in and it says, well, it's t, it's t equals four. And uh, you know the Delta VPID said, apply the set point at t equals six. And so we'll accept that command and we'll wait till t equals six and that's when we apply the set point. On the upstream and the host, they're, they're knowing that we're applying this at t equals six and so their integral can take that into effect. And uh, as is seen in the, uh, the presentation, your control doesn't go unstable for that. Yeah, that way both ends are lined up because that latency is going to vary every single time. And if you want to get precise, good control, you have to know on both ends. And the benefit of wireless hard is everybody on that mesh network, just by the nature of being on a you know, time uh, hopping network, they all know what time it is. So let's say we're taking advantage of that fact and saying, Every device, every wireless device out there knows what time it is. And so we're going to use that to take uh, the synchronization inside the, inside the device and the host. And it's on the command side. That's what I really like is that there's no, in, in the theory, the user could totally mess up the publishing setup. You know, you basically well, not even publish anything and the control will still work because it's the command that's coming in there, not the publishing. So. It's all on the, basically it's on the device and the host end of getting this control set up properly. Yeah, because once we put it in the spec, we're stuck with it. So we want to make sure it works right from the get-go. So that was pretty much the whole point of the test. And, you know, in the future when we do this, uh, basically getting this downstream publishing to where we can actually send a command in a relatively guaranteed amount of time. But again, that latency is going to be there. Um, that'll be the final piece of the puzzle that'll make it so that uh, we can do I think pretty good control. As Terry mentioned, we're, we're basically donating intellectual property to the foundation. The other side of this is that we're trying to standardize the way, you know, from a heart specification perspective, that any control system can actually apply that intellectual property and have it work across anybody's devices, valves, whatever the case may be. So that's that's the next step. The IP goes to the foundation, and we're, we're right now working on standardizing the way those interactions occur with the timestamps and all that kind of stuff so that this can be a reality for anybody to implement. There's also some other kind of neat little side effects of, of how we're doing this. We turned a 4300 into a 4 to 20 output device. 
Um, there's actually one on the trade show that we're not telling anybody's there, but I guess I just <laughs> let that slip. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's not a product we're planning on making, um, but it was something that we were very easy to retrofit into DVC so we can flip back and forth. I could, I developed the firmware for it so I can edit the firmware really quick and on the fly while we're doing this testing. Yeah, that's what we basically did. Uh, w to I. They will be on the trade show, on the technology show floor for more questions. So people are doing control of wireless today. This stuff that they're working on has to make its way into the specification and into the protocol. You will not have to change out all your devices for this to work. I got assurances of that before this talk. But there will be new devices that take advantage of these new commands so that it's all enabled. So you will see it in the future, but there are a lot of steps and a lot more testing that we have to do, but we're actually working on it today. We don't know all the ways we're going to apply all this. We're just figuring out how to do it because it's cool. I'll take a, a note, too, is uh, you can today with device-specific commands attach a thumb to a DVC and uh, change its set point. This is all done basically through device-specific uh, stuff, so it has to be a 1420 of the correct firmware version, and it has to be a a DVC with a with a thumb, uh, well, it can be a different type of adapter, but to get those two to play, it doesn't have any of this time to apply. It doesn't have any any of this new stuff we're talking about, but it's a way of if you're trying to get some throttling control today, that is one way of doing it. All right, we're going to cut you off. I want to thank our panelists for being here. Uh